Just remind me what the time frame is for this. Um, well, it's now 8 p.m. Here in Wellington is 8 in the evening. And if you could speak to us for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and that will leave us, say, 10, 15 minutes for a, uh, a conversation and some questions. That would be wonderful. All right, okay. Um, when, all right, I might speak even for a little longer. Let's see how it goes. Um, okay. So let me just, just get just my no. Oh, I don't know. Can you just pass me a copy of um, what, what is this? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, actually, Raj, can you turn these lights on and those ones off, please? Okay. Somehow? We're just going to adjust the lighting, yeah? Okay. Now, this is not being streamed, but it's going to be posted on the website. It'll be like, if you can successfully record it, we'll put it onto YouTube. Onto so, YouTube, okay. Good, all right. And the lights uh, on here? Okay, should we start? Okay, well, well Stephen, Stephen, welcome to Wellington. The last time you were in New Zealand, and you're actually here yourself, was 2012, I believe. Can we turn these ones on here? Helmets? Helmets North? Set, yeah. Set. Um, and we've had we've had you here at what you won Michael Ref many times, and um, and it's always been an interesting evening. Now, uh, just to say welcome, and uh, I have a copy here in my hand of your most recent book, which is called oh. "What Is This?" Ancient Questions for Modern Mind, which you won't be speaking about tonight, nor will you be speaking about your next book, which I believe is called "The Art of Solitude." But tonight, I think your focus is going to be on nirvana, ethics, and muck mindfulness, which is an intriguing, Michael. And we're all very keen to see what you've got to say for yourself. So, Stephen, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ramsey. And uh, as usual, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak across the world, literally. And... Um, as you said, I would like to uh, offer some reflections um, on nirvana, really, um, but linking that into ethics and linking that into uh, some of this debate that has come up recently around uh, the commodification of mindfulness, the uh, consumerization of mindfulness, which has been designated by Ron Purser and others as muck mindfulness. But uh, I'd like to start um, uh, by going into the topic of nirvana itself. And as my starting point, um, I'd like to share with you some passages from uh, a, a, an essay that was written by a Thai Buddhist teacher, Ajahn Buddhadasa, uh, in 1988. Some of you might be familiar with Buddha Dasa's work. Um, I've been aware of him ever since I've been in, involved in Buddhism, basically. I never met him, although actually Martin did uh, once in Thailand. Uh, and I didn't really follow much of his work at the time uh, in those days. Uh, and it was quite recently when I was in uh, teaching in Paris a, a year or so ago uh, that I was giving a talk on Nirvana, Nirvana and after the, afterwards, a fellow came up to me, a young French guy, uh, who works in, the, in Bangkok at the archive of Buddha Dasa. In other words, it's an institution set up to preserve and to disseminate the teachings of Buddha Dasa. And he said, this young French man said to me, you know, a lot of what you say is very similar to what Buddha Dasa says, particularly about Nirvana. And he gave me then a little booklet um, with this essay in it, which is called Nirvana for Everyone. And when I read that, I was kind of blown away. I, I've been completely unaware of Buddha Dasa's thoughts on Nirvana. I knew that he rejected the doctrine of rebirth, which uh, is quite remarkable for a senior Asian Buddhist monk, and that had always been an important point of confirmation in my own thinking as well. But I wasn't at all aware of his work on Nibbana. So let's um, just look at some of what Buddha Dasa says in this uh, essay. 
he starts by saying, when you hear the words nirvana for everyone, many of you will shake your heads. You'll think that I'm trying to dye cats for sale and probably won't have any interest in the subject. A dying cats for sale is basically uh, disguising an ordinary street cat as something more exotic. Um, and uh, that, I think, reflects quite well uh, what many Buddhists would, uh, how many Buddhists would respond, even today, um, if you were to uh, ex suggest that nirvana is for everyone. Um, Buddha Dasa continues, he says, Nirvana has become a secret that no one cares about. We have turned it into something barren and silent, buried away in the scriptures, to be paid occasional lip service while no one really knows what it is. Uh, again, very true. Nirvana has somehow been banished um, for, from uh, its central role in the practice of the Dharma. Um, nirvana is often thought of as so uh, remote and elevated and profound that unless one is a very highly accomplished monk or spends years and years and years and years in meditation, you won't even get close to it. Now that has always struck me as a very strange way of understanding something that the Buddha himself described as clearly visible, immediate, and um, inviting. In other words, we do find this odd text, which scholars think of as probably a very early instance of Gautama's uh, teaching, uh, a phrase in which he says the Dharma, sometimes he says Nirvana, the two terms are interchangeable, is clearly visible, immediate, inviting, uplifting, and personally experienced by the wise. The wise, not the Buddhists, the wise. And uh, this passage again jumps off the page because it seems to co contradict the idea that Nirvana is a, 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 a very advanced, a very ultimate kind of experience that uh, only great meditators have access to. Now, if we go further on in the essay, um, Buddha Dasa makes himself even more explicit uh, by saying this, and this is, this, is his, this is his language, not mine. Any reactive emotion that arises ceases when its causes and conditions are finished. Although it may be a temporary quenching, merely a temporary coolness, it is still nirvana, if only temporarily. It is this temporary nirvana that sustains the life of beings, including animals. Anyone can see that if the egotistic emotions existed day and night without pause, no life could endure it. We are able to survive because this kind of nirvana nurtures us until it becomes the most ordinary habit of life and mind. Now, when I read that, I found that to be the most extraordinary confirmation of my own work on trying to understand nirvana, which I again have uh, pursued through reading these early Pali texts, uh, but in complete unawareness uh, that Buddha Dasa uh, seems to have followed a very, very similar uh, line of inquiry and come up with um, uh, an understanding that's essentially uh, the same as mine. Buddha Dasa does not, as far as I'm, I'm aware, locate this within the framework of uh, four tasks. Uh, I suspect he's still very much within the frame of the Four Noble Truths. But if he had been, this would have uh, fitted extraordinarily well. He says, any reactive emotion that arises ceases when its causes and conditions are finished. In other words, when I speak of reactivity, whether it's attachment or fear or opinionatedness, it arises and we watch it arise, we are aware of it, it's arising, and if we let it be, 
the second task, we can see it ceasing. And then when we uh, are aware of that stopping of reactivity, we see nirvana itself. Nirvana therefore becomes uh, the still, open, responsive space from which we then can engage with the situation at hand in a way that's not determined by our, uh, 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 our, our greed, our hatred, uh, and our egotistic confusion, our opinions, and so on. So this um, brings us very much to the idea that uh, nirvana is actually something that's uh, uh, present uh, within us, within each of us, at every moment. Uh, as you're listening to what I'm saying, as I'm speaking these words, um, the presence of non-reactivity, uh, either in your listening or in my speaking, is actually the nirvanic space. Um, it, and that is the very hinge on which uh, the dynamic of the path turns. In other words, embracing uh, dukkha, embracing life, uh, letting go or letting reactivity be, seeing the stopping of reactivity, which is seeing nirvana, then is the condition that enables us to cultivate a way of life that's not predicated on the repetitive, uh, instinctive, habits of uh, greed and attachment and so forth and so on. And another point I think here to mention is how at the opening uh, paragraph of the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, the Discourse on the Foundations of Mindfulness, uh, Gautama uh, opens by saying mindfulness is the one way to nirvana or the direct way to nirvana. And I think that that is not just a piece of polemic uh, designed to somehow give mindfulness some greater uh, importance, but it is simply a statement of fact that uh, to practice mindfulness, uh, to rest in a mindful attention that's not running after things or pushing things away is already nirvana. Uh, it's not as though the practice of mindfulness will years and years and years and years later lead you to a glimpse of nirvana. No. Whenever you practice mindfulness, you are already experiencing a nirvanic space. Now, this to me um, has uh, a, a number of implications. Um, one of which is that uh, mindfulness, which we now know is widespread uh, through the world, uh, and nirvana, are inseparable. And that implies that the, whether you are a monk in a monastery in Burma, or whether you are a uh, housewife uh, in Wellington looking after three or four noisy kids, your practice of mindfulness will be effectively the way you relate to your life from a non-reactive state, which is the state of nirvana. In other words, this idea of nirvana for everyone and mindfulness as the, uh, the one way to get there um, is, um, is, is, is totally and utterly democratic. Uh, it doesn't require any particular privileged role as a monk or as a meditation teacher uh, or anything uh, to be available and accessible to us. This is, if I were a Christian missionary, I would say this is the good news. This is the gospel, if you wish. Uh, and as, as Buddha Dasa says, if you say that to people today, they'll shake their heads and think you're trying to con them. Now we'll come on to the work of Ron Purser and others who have taken up a case against the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the teaching and the presentation of mindfulness um, in the wider capitalist consumerist world. 
and um, have effectively denounced the popularization of mindfulness. And they use this uh, term, muk mindfulness. Now, I think a lot is buried in muk mindfulness, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But the reason that uh, is often cited um, against the popularization of mindfulness is because it takes mindfulness out of the ethical context of the Buddhist tradition. It singles it out as though it's a kind of an isolated little technique or tool, uh, and you can apply it to whatever nefarious ends you wish to, um, uh, to put it to. So you can use it to rip people off in your business, you can use it to shoot people more effectively, and so forth and so on. Um, and perhaps that is in fact how it's being used. I don't know. In any case, um, the argument against uh, it um, somehow making, uh, taking the argument that it denies the context of ethics and can then be turned towards uh, achieving the goals of some uh, commercial capitalist enterprise. Um, I think is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is basically misguided. Um, and there's two ways we can look at this. One is to notice that there are in fact uh, some uh, Buddhist uh, mindfulness teachers um, uh, who uh, use a mindfulness in ways that we would act or use uh, uh, or lead an ethical life in ways that we would find very difficult to understand. And this, I would particularly want to illustrate by uh, citing some examples of what is actually going on in Asia today, Burma and Sri Lanka in particular, where here we have uh, Buddhist monks, uh, and as far as we can tell, Buddhist monks who are, are good monks, who, who, who keep the vows, who are dedicated and committed to the Dharma, uh, who are very learned uh, men, um, who are probably very well motivated. And these are people who uh, certainly not only practice mindfulness, uh, but practice it within the context of its Buddhist environment, uh, its Buddhist ethical environment. Uh, and yet, when we look at some of the things they actually do, um, we could be quite surprised that um, that that the, they would be advocating a Buddhist ethics, an ethics of nonviolence, an ethics of harmlessness, an ethics of care. We find both in Sri Lanka and in Burma in the last uh, years, uh, senior Buddhist monks who are advocating the opposite. They're advocating violence. They're advocating persecution of other religions, Islam in particular. Um, they are uh, offering blessings to uh, soldiers uh, who go into battle to fight for uh, the nationhood of Sri Lanka, the nationhood of Burma. Um, and I think for many uh, Western people, um, this is a very uncomfortable um, uh, image of a tradition that they've always admired for its stance on nonviolence. And we have to be clear here, we're not talking about the occasional rogue bhikkhu who has uh, got some personal grievance or rant against Tamils or, or Rohingya Muslims. We're talking about some of the most prominent, if not the most prominent Buddhist teachers in those countries. Um, while Pola Rahula, the famous author of What the Buddha Taught, uh, Sri Lankan, he supported the persecution and the war against the Tamils. And when I was in uh, Burma a couple of years ago, I met with uh, Sitagu Sayadaw, who is arguably the most influential uh, and uh, respected uh, monk in Burma today. And uh, uh, Sitagu, charming man, very you know, very articulate, uh, seems like a wonderful guy, um, is uh, quite explicitly um, uh, encouraging the Burmese people to 
uh, insist on the purity of their race and their religion and to work against any forces that threaten the integrity of that uh, uh, ethnic national identity. And they've singled out the Rohingya, um, the Muslim people who came from Bengal in the 19th century um, as somehow the greatest threat to the country of Burma and the Buddhist religion. Um, now, if that's... Um, if, so here we have, in, in response to the muck mindfulness uh, people, here we have an example of people who, who practice and teach uh, mindfulness within the context of Buddhism, but who behave in ways that I would find um, very questionable on the grounds of Buddhist uh, ethics. Um, again, I don't want to go on and on and on and on about this, but if this is the kind of ethics practiced by the most senior figures in the Buddhist traditions, uh, particularly the traditions in the, which the practice of mindfulness originated, then um, in what way are business people who use mindfulness to help them cope better with a pressurized work environment uh, being unethical? So, oh, this, okay, it's gone. Um, now, um, this, uh, so in other words, it sounds sort of simple, take mindfulness out of the Buddhist ethical context and you somehow damage, you somehow compromise it fatally. If you leave it in the Buddhist context, you can also see what ha happens to it. It doesn't necessarily uh, lead people to engage, oh shit, engage people uh, to, uh, to engage with ethics. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Um, so that's one concern I have. Uh, I don't think that equation can be so, uh, I think that equation is just way too simplistic. Uh, and it does cast a light on what we mean by Buddhist ethics, and not just in theory, but how it is actually enacted in concrete situations in Buddhist countries today. Now, the other problem I have with uh, muck mindfulness is that it tends to reflect the viewpoint and prejudices of privileged middle-class vegetarians who look down not only on McDonald's, which is obviously the reference to muck mindfulness, but also the kind of people who eat in McDonald's. And it gives the impression that mindfulness would somehow be wasted on such people who would only turn it to their selfish, superficial ends. And Buddhists are particularly troubled when uh, mindfulness is used in the army, uh, by the armed forces, forgetting that our freedom to practice mindfulness is underwritten by a society that will protect that freedom by force if need be. And there are two things going on here that middle-class privileged Buddhists in the West don't really seem to have understood. Um, I find that mindfulness is, is basically a put-down of the working class. It's a put-down of uh, the whole phenomenon of McDonald's. Uh, it fails to really have any uh, understanding of um, uh, the fact that for, for some people, eating at McDonald's is, uh, is a good thing. It, it's, some, it's, it's, it's a treat. Uh, um, if you're used to, uh, you know, if you're living in an impoverished uh, uh, way and you can barely feed your kids, then to take them to McDonald's is a, I think it's a, it's a sign that of you're having achieved some, some, uh, ability to enjoy eating in a restaurant rather than at home. Um, I, I, just don't f I, I just find this whole thing rather um, disturbing, frankly. Um, and it touches me also in the way that um, we kind of assume that people who go to McDonald's are not ethical. But that is, again, I think, an enormous assumption to make. Uh, my own experience as a Buddhist 
prison chaplain, which I did for about 12 years when I lived in England, uh, was one that was, a, was very humbling. It took me down off my privileged white middle class pedestal and uh, put me into a world uh, of incarcerated men, um, some of them serving time for very, you know, very horrible crimes. And yet, when I was engaging with these men, I was aware that they struggled with ethical questions as much as I did. Um, uh, even though they're considered to be, in a sense, at the bottom rung of society, you know, locked up in jail, this doesn't mean that they're kind of psych psychopathic brutes. There might be some like that, I suppose. But the vast majority of prisoners that I worked with um, were, were, were people like myself, people like you, who have made a bad decision, got carried away by some emotion, fell under the influence of someone else, were driven by poverty uh, or social deprivation to commit acts that led them into jail. Um, but they, like all people I know, uh, are concerned with what it means to be good, what it means to lead uh, a wholesome and uh, a skillful life. They have values. They're not uh, operating in some ethical void at all. They have regrets. They feel guilt. They feel shame at what they have done. Uh, all of which are indicators of an ethical awareness. Um, and likewise, although we hear, and I've heard it not just from Ron Purser, but you hear it from other writers in the Buddhist field, uh, that people who practice mindfulness in these big corporations are just going to become more efficient tools in the capitalist uh, system that is destroying the world and so forth and so on. Again, it's a, it's, it's a nice piece of rhetoric, but where are these people? Show me one of these people some office worker who's basically just become a kind of a, a kind of an impersonal cog in a machine. I never, I, I, I don't know who these people are. Uh, they don't sound human, frankly. Again, I think this is a projection of a, a kind of stereotype uh, that um, privileged uh, people uh, like ourselves may often have about uh, the, you know, the, the, the corp corporate capitalism. But let's think of the actual human being, the actual man or woman who is working in that situation, probably because they have to provide for their families, they have to get by, they have to make a living, they're trying to do better for their children than they've managed to do for themselves. These are ethical people. Um, uh, they're not all sort of the wolf on Wall Street, not at all. And this, I think, brings us back very, um, very much to Buddha Dasa. Mindfulness for everyone. Sorry, nirvana for everyone. Uh, I think if you take that seriously, then that does mean everyone. It means people who work in McDonald's, people who work for um, Monsanto or whatever. These people, too, um, are capable of being mindful, are capable of experiencing moments of non-reactivity, are capable, and in not just capable, but do uh, find themselves reflecting on questions of good and evil, of ethics, of right and wrong. So that's my gripe against this mindfulness uh, prejudice. Um, uh, I, I, it, it's, it, it's to me, uh, it, 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 it's ill-founded and um, I think it is biased uh, against certain classes of people and it has, I think, a naive and uh, idealistic sense of what Buddhist, uh, you know, senior Buddhist uh, teachers and monks uh, are ethically able to do. Um, finally, the armed forces. Um, I also was once invited to a, uh, the, the, the British, I forget what exactly what it's called, but basically once a year, the British uh, army puts on a day-long symposium on Buddhism for its Buddhist uh, uh, members. In other words, uh, soldiers, sailors, aircraft, airmen, women, 
who uh, are Buddhist, and they have two Buddhist chaplains now in the Buddhist uh, armed forces, as well as um, people coming from the Ministry of Defense and elsewhere who gather together for a day on a military base uh, to hear, hear about Buddhism and to discuss it in terms of their lives and their work. This too was a very moving experience for me to spend a day with military people who again do not fit the stereotype that many white meditators probably have. These again are ordinary people who are struggling to do the best and make sense of their world. And um, they, they are, I feel, as much um, uh, entitled uh, to the practice of mindfulness uh, as anybody else. Um, and I think we have to really think carefully about how the, the, there's danger of, 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 of somehow privileging uh, these spiritual practices of Buddhism uh, to those who are somehow sufficiently well educated, sufficiently, let's say, con self-conscious and aware, who could make good use of them. I think that is uh, uh, really going in the wrong direction. Uh, and I feel that a secular dharma is one that is also a dharma that is open to the whole world, that is open to people from all backgrounds, all uh, races, all uh, gender and uh, sexual uh, types and orientations. Um, and this, I think, is, is, is really the universal message of the Dharma, that Nirvana is for everyone. And Nirvana is not some remote state, but Nirvana is present every moment in your life when reactivity stops, even temporarily, and that space of ethical clarity opens up. Because Nirvana, in the end, is not a kind of mystical attainment uh, transcending this world. Nirvana is the, uh, the sensitized, uh, attentive space from which we live our lives. And as a secular practitioner of the secular Dharma, uh, this has got nothing to do with religious beliefs. It has nothing to do with kowtowing to the uh, superiority of enlightened monks or lamas or roshis or whatever. It has to do with uh, refining and cultivating over time in your own daily life this uh, ethical, non-reactive space that is called nirvana. Uh, and the practice is rooted very much in, uh, in deepening our sense and becoming more grounded and dwelling in that perspective. So that's all I want to say. Uh, to you this evening, this morning, whatever. It's my morning, your evening. And um, we still have time. If anyone would like to offer a um, comment or ask a question, please do so. If you want to say something, could you please get up and stand and talk to the lap, look at the laptop? Which will be recorded. I know it's very tempting to look at Stephen in the big screen, but we have to look at the laptop. So whoever, please, go ahead. Hi, Stephen. Uh, my name's Alex. Um, Hello, Alex. Hello. Um, so last week, last Wednesday, we had a session at One Mindful Breath, which was discussing Ron Purse's book and mindfulness. We've got mm -hmm. some interesting comments and feedback through that. Um, but one thing which I particularly wanted to raise is, I mean, firstly, I think I got sent that article, you know, the things in The Guardian and things like that, about three times from different people. Mm -hmm. uh, and almost using it as a good excuse, like, oh, great, now I don't have to meditate because the whole thing's a sham. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing which I was really thinking about when I read it is whether the degree to which it was really applicable to secular Buddhism. And where I was coming from was looking at, well, to some extent, it's a question about the ethics and the framework. Like when I read, um, when I read your work on, on secular Buddhism, I see it as the Dharma, as like mm -hmm. a kind of awakening. And that's to me like the wider context, that's sort of like, mm -hmm. that's, that's something which is a great thing which can enhance someone's life. If I was just doing 
the first three tasks and not the fourth task, I feel a little bit like I would be missing out. Um, and so I could sort of see if I was skewing one person's book a little bit. I completely agree with the point about religious Buddhism and the sort of inherent classism in the article. But I did sort of think, well, he is sort of making a little bit of a push to say, maybe we could do a little bit more than just ceasing reactivity. I'm interested in your comments on that. Um, well, you see, but again, I don't think that's, again, I think that's a misrepresentation of how mindfulness is actually taught and practiced in secular settings. I don't think it's just about um, stopping reactivity. Uh, that's certainly key to the whole therapeutic application of mindfulness is to learn to be in a non-reactive space. Um, but, and it's also true, I mean, I, I've also argued this myself, that we actually need to be more explicit about the framework within which mindfulness operates. I know that John Kabat-Zinn has expressed concerns about this too. He'd like to make the term Dharma more central in the mindfulness world, to, uh, to, to make it more clear that it's not just about being non-reactive. It's about learning to live differently. Um, and I think that there is some validity, at least in the abstract, uh, to that uh, concern. And certainly um, I've heard from people who do the mindfulness eight-week course, for example, when they get to the end of that course, they, 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 they're they left with the question, and now what do I do? So yes, I think there is room, definitely, uh, within the mindfulness world to uh, expand uh, the uh, framework within which mindfulness is presented. Uh, that I, I, I do agree with. Uh, but then, on the other hand, I find that that's happening anyway. Uh, the people who I meet who come from the mindfulness world um, are making uh, all kinds of uh, developments in uh, that uh, understanding to increase it um, and to bring it more into line, say, with more philosophical, ethical uh, frameworks. But the other thing I, I feel is more important, perhaps, is that we tend to underestimate the extent to which people live uh, with ethical concerns. Um, I, I, again, I think the picture of somebody who goes to a mindfulness intervention and learns how to be non-reactive, and that's just the end of it, is, is very simplistic. We're not machines who learn to be mindful, and then we got that little trick sorted out, and then we just get on with the rest of our lives without any alteration. Uh, that's not my experience. Um, I find that as soon as you become less reactive, as soon as you learn to just settle, all kinds of other stuff starts happening. Uh, not because the teacher or Buddhism is pu pushing anything into that space, but because when the mind quietens down, you are able actually to hear your own, your, own, your own voices, your own voice. You're able to start paying attention to questions, concerns that have basically been blocked out by the white noise of uh, everyday mental chatter and all of the incredible inputs we get now from the media uh, that don't give us the time to think, don't give us the time to reflect. Mindfulness gives us the time to reflect. It allows questions to come to the surface that have previously been ignored. Uh, and that, again, is the beginning of an ethical life. So I do support the idea that the mindfulness community needs to expand its uh, presentation of these practices in a more explicitly ethical frame. Um, I think that's true. But... At the same time, I think that tends to overlook how uh, people are concerned with ethical issues. Um, in any case, um, that uh, it's already there. And mindfulness, in a sense, serves simply to awaken people to their own ethical concerns. So it's a, it's a balance of the two, really. Um, I'm glad that this conversation uh, with Mac Mindfulness and so on is happening. I think it's good that these questions are being addressed. But what I'm warning against is how we 
it, how it can also reinforce certain other prejudices and biases that we have as privileged white middle class people. I, I have a question. Can you can just sort of yes. come up to? I can hear you quite well, actually. But I'm going to speak. I've been instructed. Uh, I guess my you. my reaction to what you said is the fact that you know within corporations that's not their intention. The corporations, the you know, which is becoming kind of mainstream, whether people are doing mindfulness within the New Zealand police or mindfulness within Google or mindfulness with any. The intention really is the calming down, being present aspect, right? Not mm -hmm. necessarily are they directing their staff, employees to start thinking about ethical questions or listening to their own voice. That is not the intention of it. And so I guess my question to you more specifically is, even if, that, if that's not the intent, mindfulness still serves that purpose or can serve that purpose within a corporate environment, within the kind of modernization of mindfulness within mainstream business. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, this brings, brings me to the, uh, the analogy of the Trojan horse. That um, mindfulness is a bit like the Trojan horse. You bring it into the city, the people welcome it into the city. They think, hey, great, big horse. Um, but uh, once it gets into the city, then, at a moment when people are not looking, all, others, all of these soldiers inside the horse get out into the city and, and start, something else starts happening. I think mindfulness is a bit like that. I think it comes uh, as a kind of uh, a rather neutral, sort of about just calming and getting still, and corporations can be quite keen on that. Oh, yeah, sure, we get our workforce a little bit more chilled, a little bit more happy, <laughs> then, uh, then we can make lots and lots and lots more money and we can be more efficient. Well, that may be the intention. But uh, despite those intentions, mindfulness uh, is a dangerous thing to, to play with. And my sense is that uh, once you, you, you get the seed of mindfulness planted in people's uh, bodies and minds, um, uh, all, all sorts of other things start happening. And um, so, yeah, the intention is probably not at all about making their workforce more ethical or more self-conscious. But what I experience on many, uh, you know, many of the te lectures I give and retreats I lead is there's all sorts of people who now, once their eyes have been opened by mindfulness, they can't close them again. That's the other thing. You see, once you've had the taste of mindfulness, the taste of being still, of being open, of being present to what's actually going on, you can't forget that. You can't switch it off. It's somehow your, your, your Dharma eye has been opened. Now, many people might, you know, that may not be particularly significant for them. They may have other concerns in their lives and they won't take it any further. But there's going to always be a certain percentage, and I don't know what that percentage is, of people for whom they're given this treatment for some other reason, to get rid of anxiety or to be a better worker, but end up having a kind of, you know, some sort of spiritual awakening. Uh, they may not call it that. Uh, they probably don't. But they find themselves in a different modality of consciousness. And uh, that's where the change starts. Uh, that's where another perspective becomes possible. And um, so in some ways, I think mindfulness is like, the, you, know, you let the genie out of the bottle and you can't put it back in again, to use another metaphor. Um, so that's what, I, that's what I observe, let's say. Um, that's an, I, this is what I see at work in our world. Um, and yes, I think some of these criticisms are, are valid. Uh, even the mindful criticism you know, has its points. But if we're really going to democratize the Dharma, if we're really going to make these practices available to everyone, not just people who could afford to go on retreats and buy Stephen Batchelor's books, but ordinary people, uh, then uh, 
we do, I think, need to acknowledge that even if it's only for one mindful breath, that can turn your life around. That can open up other possibilities. It can sensitize you to yourself and to your world from another perspective, which will then lead who knows where. Uh, hi, another question. Um, yes, who are you? Uh, I'm Steve. Hi. Uh, so I'm quite interested in, um, well, I quite like what you're saying there about how mindfulness gives you that clarity to act with ethic. Um, and I can see how that would fit quite, quite well into this more dynamic view of Nirvana. Uh -huh. which really. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the development of ethic from this more um, dynamic view of Nirvana. So could you just repeat it? Could I speak more about the dynamic of ethics from the... Uh, the development of ethic from... The development of ethics from the Nirvanic standpoint. From the more dynamic Nirvanic standpoint. The, the, okay, the, yeah. Well, you see, um, first of all, I think we need to just step back and ask ourselves, well, what do we mean by this word ethics? Uh, what's the difference between ethics and morality, for example? Um, so again, we throw this word ethics around, ethical this and ethical that, but it, it's worth actually pausing and asking ourselves what we mean. Um, ethics to me is not the same as morality. Morality, I would understand, is largely to do with um, uh, following and adhering to certain guidelines and rules and precepts uh, that are either encoded in our legal systems or in our religions. So not killing, not stealing, and so forth and so on. Um, that's morality and that is a necessary part of any kind of cohesive society that we need to somehow agree on certain moral norms of what's acceptable um, ethics is deeper than that ethics is the it, it touches down into the deeper question of, of what is my life really about what kind of person do i aspire to be what sort of you know, what's the image I have of myself in terms of being a good person, in terms of being a responsible person? Ethics is about how we uh, think about the purpose of our lives and think about our conception of what a good life would be, given the kinds of values and norms that I've either grown up with or I intuitively feel within myself. Uh, for example, I might value wisdom, I might value compassion and love and tolerance. Uh, these are, 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 are broad ethical values. But each person will have a particular relationship to those values. In other words, you know, I, 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 I admire people who are wise and compassionate and loving, and I have particular examples, maybe Mother Teresa or Jacinda Ahern or whoever it is. The, the, these are ethical models. And at the same time, I seek to live my life in which I embody those same kinds of values in my life. And not just because that's morally right or wrong, but because that is what uh, furthers my own flourishing and development as a human person in a human society. Ethics is the larger question of what constitutes a good life and how I as a human person uh, can seek to embody that good life that you know that's what Buddhists would say skillful or wholesome but it's the same thing so the nirvanic uh, experience is one that um, allows us to have a greater uh, I think both time and capacity to attune ourselves with our core ethical values and to reflect on ourselves in terms of how well or badly we live up to those ethical values. And also, in a much more specific way, it gives us the, the, the uh, it cultivates over time a kind of an ethical intelligence 
I think that the nibbanic space, the, the non-reactive space, is, is entirely necessary for developing our ethical intelligence. And this is, of course, done in the face of concrete ethical situations. It's not just, we're not moral philosophers in a university. We are human beings living in uh, very often conflicted situations in the world. Well, it might be in the family, it might be in the workplace, it might be in our church or wherever it is. But we have to struggle with having to make decisions, for example. We have to decide what I'm going to do in this situation or that situation. That is where ethical intelligence is cultivated. And a non-reactive frame of mind is, as I understand it, um, a, a very appropriate environment in which to conduct that reflection in a way that's not constantly being interfered with by, I like this, I don't like that, this is my view, I don't want to be seen. The, all of those kind of reactive patterns of mind that keep getting in the way of our capacity to reflect more clearly and deeply. So Nirvana is opening up a space for an ethical reflection, the cultivation of ethical intelligence. But not only that, I think another central part of this uh, Nibbanic uh, perspective, this non-reactive perspective, is that it also is the ground of the courage to actually act. Uh, you can have all of the best ethical intentions, you can be ethically very wise, but you may not have the courage to act on your convictions. I suffer from this. I sometimes feel I don't have the courage of my convictions. So this, the, the, this non-reactive space is also a space that's grounded in your bodily experience. It's something in which we seek to dwell and learn to feel rooted. And that, I feel, is what gives us, in the end, courage or courage, strength of heart. Strength of heart. To be able to, be, to have the, the capacity not only to say, you know, you know, this is how I should act in this situation, but to actually give us the strength to do so. Uh, so both of those things, uh, the, the spaciousness, the freedom, the capacity to refine intelligence, and also a groundedness in our body and mind that gives us the inner strength to actually act on those intentions. Thanks. Has anybody got any quick one-liner questions? Because it's five to nine now, and I'm sure everybody's dying for a cup of tea. Got a cool okay, we've got four minutes. I've, I've got my mid-morning coffee to get to. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. This is Mithun. Um, Hi, Mithun. I'm not sure if this is a quick question or not, but I was just wondering, um, what's the difference between, you know, like when it comes to Nirvana, the way you explained it, um, what's the difference between an awakened one and a lay person like me? You know, like how do they, how, I mean, uh, looking at scriptures, do you actually know how an awakened person experienced nirvana? Like, does it mean that they um, are mindful in each and every moment of their life? Or, you know, like what's, the, what's your view on that? And, you know. Well, thank you very much. That's a good question. Uh, and it's not... I'll try to do it as briefly as I can. Um, again, I think we have to notice that in your question, there lay a binary opposition, uh, which is what religion trades on. You have the ordinary person, like me, the ordinary lay person, and you have the awakened person. That's a binary opposition. And it's a very uh, useful device to basically put the ordinary person in their place and to elevate the awakened person to some impossible height of, uh, of enlightenment or whatever. In a secular Dharma approach, we are very suspicious of these kinds of binary oppositions. And also the objectification of those binary oppositions. In other words, a monk on a throne and a lay person sitting at the back of the room, or a lay woman, you know, even further at the back of the room. Let's try to think of this in terms of spectrums. I think each moment of our lives 
um, is an opportunity to respond to the situation in a more or less awake way. In other words, um, uh, rather than asking, you know, how would the awakened person deal with this situation? The real question is how do I deal with this situation in a more awake way? or a less awake way. In other words, awakening, non-awakening, delusion, enlightenment, are not binary oppositions, but they are poles within a spectrum of experience that is available to us in each minute. Now, the Zen tradition understands this very well. And one of my favorite uh, citations from Hui Neng, who is the sixth patriarch of the, of the Zen tradition in China. He lived at the beginning of the 8th century. Uh, one of his statements is, when an ordinary person becomes awakened, we call them a Buddha. When a Buddha becomes deluded, we call them an ordinary person. In other words, there's no binary opposition here. We simply acknowledge that human experience operates along the spectrum, which for convenience we can call delusion and enlightenment. But there's no, uh, there's no cutoff point. It's not two separate things at all, but a blurry kind of spectrum. And of course, in the you know, as, as, as we develop our practice and so forth and so on, we hopefully lead a, a more rather than a less awakened life. And there might be moments where we are responding to the situation exactly in the same way as the Buddha would have responded to it. And the next moment, we could be responding to another situation in the way the Buddha definitely wouldn't have responded to it. So treat these ideas really as kind of uh, frameworking uh, elements that enable you to get a kind of better sense of where your capabilities lie. That seems like it's 11 o'clock. That sounds like a good place to start. Yes. Not really yes or no, but you can answer yes or no, right? I'm speaking loud. Yeah, okay, okay. You're more comfortable with my head here, aren't you? Uh, in front. Oh, in front of him. In front of him. Okay. It's okay. All right. I feel like I know you now. Uh, the question around the courage. So the, are you saying uh, the deeper our state of mindfulness or our practice of mindfulness, is that where we generate more courage? I love the connection that you made, but around, because I think we lack the courage. Is, is, that, is that the answer? The deeper we get in that state, the more courage we have? That could be yes or no. Um, well, unfortunately, it can't. Um, <laughs> Um, I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't say yes, although broadly speaking, I think that's true. I think the, the more grounded we come in mindfulness, the, 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 perhaps the more courage we get. But the point is that when we start unpacking the psychology of what goes on in, let's say, a session of mindfulness, we find that mindfulness is never operating independently of other elements. Uh, my friend Christina Feldman talks of mindfulness as a team player. In other words, if you look at the ways in which um, mindfulness is understood in Buddhism, it's, it's always in clusters. Uh, you, have mindful, you have the five powers, you know, confidence, mindfulness, effort, uh, concentration, intelligence, um, and other lists that Buddhists love. And mindfulness is, is, is usually embedded within a complex of other uh, of, of, of other um, skills. It's, it's not a one, it's, it's not a panacea for all problems. Uh, it, re, it requires that there's a sense of confidence in what we're doing, that we are able to focus our energies into this practice, uh, that we're able to stabilize the mind, that we're able to become more discerning. And none of those things are strictly speaking mindfulness. But mindfulness, in a sense, holds those uh, human qualities uh, within a certain configuration and, and, and stabilizes them perhaps and allows them to function uh, more um, effectively perhaps. Uh, so that's the long, slightly longer question. I think we need to do, and again, this is maybe one of the mindfulness critiques that mindfulness is sort of singled out and it's 
no longer really seen as an integral part of a more complex uh, way of, uh, of, 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 of living and behaving. But I do think we have to stop. Yeah. Can I, thank you. Thank thank you. Can I just, just remind us there's a little courage, little awakening, great courage, great oh, awakening. Yeah. Three parts to that. Can you just remind us what those are? Yeah, the, um, this uh, Ramsey's referring to something that you'll find in the book, What Is This? And um, there's a, again, a Zen uh, saying that goes, little questioning, oh, wait a minute, great questioning, great awakening. Little questioning, little awakening. No questioning, no awakening. And, and that, again, uh, is to me an important point that correlates uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the quality of inquiry we have, the quality of seriousness that we give to our practice with the kind of awakening that is then resonating at that pitch or somehow is then opened up to us. Uh, the awakening does not exist as something, some kind of mystical state that you get one day or you don't get one day, but it's a function of our of our questioning, our, our, the kinds of questions we ask will determine the kind of awakening we might arrive at. Like you can't separate awakening or insight or mindfulness from uh, the framework within which it is uh, introduced, which it operates. Okay, let's stop there. Thank you for your time and for sharing your wisdom. Um, we'll let you get on to your coffee. We'll have our evening, um, our tea and biscuits. And uh, we look to see you again in Wellington at some point in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsey. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good, well, hey, don't have a good day. Have a good night's sleep. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to leave the meeting then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.